Good morning, church. Glad you guys are here this morning, whether you're joining us in person or you're joining us online. Thanks for being part of uh, worship this week. I think that what we do here is very important. And again, whether you are here in person or with us online, um, important what God is doing in our church, in our community, and in the world. Well, my name is Jim. I am the student pastor here at Boulevard Christian Church. I've been here for a little bit over five years, and I work with junior higher, junior high, and high school students. And one of the aspects of my job is I plan all of our events that we have for students. And I have a love-hate relationship with trips and events. It's a lot of planning. A lot of stuff goes into it. But boy, is it a lot of fun. And so as I'm planning these trips, as I'm planning these events, one of the things that often comes up is, is there is a child, a student, who's never been away from home before. And they start getting a little scared. They get a little worried. And so I typically have a conversation with them. And I tell them, I say, throughout the years that I've been doing student ministry, listen, I've taken hundreds, maybe thousands of kids on different trips. Sometimes we'll go around Tulsa. Sometimes we will go all the way to like Joplin, Missouri. Even every summer with our high schoolers, we typically go to Cleveland, Tennessee. And I'll say, through all that time, God has been doing so much with students and, and so many opportunities that just open up because you come on a trip. And I say, you need to come on this trip. And again, hundreds, th maybe thousands of kids throughout the years. And out of all those kids, there's only been like four that have died. And really, like, your, your chances are pretty good. And you're like, well, two died, two are missing, but we're still hopeful that they'll find the other two. And it'll, it'll be fine. I don't really say that. Uh, but, as, but as we're going on these trips, you can talk to my sponsors, you can talk to parents, you talk to kids. Here's what you find out about me and trips. I'm a little bit of a stickler when it comes to the schedule. Schedule is important to me, not because that's how I'm naturally wired, but when you have all these kids going this far of a distance, you have all these schedules that are trying to line up, schedule is important. And so I will tell students to meet at this time because we need to leave by this time, and then we need to arrive and unpack and all that other stuff. Without fail, can you guess what slows us down the most? Bathroom breaks bathroom breaks and sometimes we take 70 75 people to our high school CIY event and you can imagine how often we have to stop and go to the bathroom and I'm just a stickler with this and so I'll tell them we're about to leave go to the bathroom and they'll say I don't need to go and I'll tell them go anyway and so we do, we'll do this a couple years ago we were heading all the way to Cleveland Tennessee it's like a 14 hour drive and so I said, go to the bathroom, go to the bathroom, go to the bathroom. We want to get as far as we can before we have to stop. We had planned to stop and everything. About 15 minutes in, there was a, somebody said, we need to stop and go to the bathroom. And I'm driving. I'm like, who is it? Who needs to stop? And one of my sponsors goes, it's me. <laughs> and something's happened throughout the years. I'm 31 now. Maybe it's when I hit 30, but my bladder kind of changed. And so I used to go hours and hours without going to the bathroom, and now that's not the case anymore. And so sometimes I'll be such a stickler on the bathroom, and I'm, I'm juggling so many things before a trip that I won't go to the bathroom. And so I'm driving, and I'm like, uh-oh. I'm such a stickler, and I'm holding these people to account, but I'm the one that has to go to the bathroom. But I've yet on a trip to say, we need to pull over and for me to go to the bathroom. So I'll wait for a student, which will, uh, which will inevitably happen. And they say, I need to go to the bathroom, and I'll, I'll put on a show. Seriously? Are you serious? Fine. We'll pull over, and I'll go to the bathroom. And I'm like, hey, we're, we're pulling over. Might as well. Might as well go, you know, take time to go to the bathroom. Because I'm holding them to this standard that I don't always follow myself. You know what I mean? You see, the book of Galatians has a lot of the same theme. Maybe not bathroom, but there are Christians that are holding other Christians, or maybe even baby Christians, or want to be Christians, to a standard that we can't possibly uphold ourselves. See, Paul, throughout the book of Galatians, is fighting so desperately against it. And time and time and time again, you see this theme. Jesus is how you are saved, not the ability to uphold the law. Jesus is how you are saved, not based on how well you, how, how well or not well, you follow the rules. Jesus is how you are saved. You see, Peter and Paul even got into a beef over this. They argued about it. They had this whole big discussion. These are two giants of the faith going after it about something that seems so simple to us. But thousands of years later, we see the same debates. 
we see the same conflicts happening amongst followers of Christ today. Here's the theme we see in Galatians, we still see it today, that you have to fight against this lie, that if you try hard enough, maybe, just maybe, you'll become a better Christian. If you just follow more rules, God maybe, just maybe, will love and bless you more. You see, with this lie, the emphasis is on yourself. It's, a, it's all about you. If you just try harder, if you're just better, if you fall short, it's because you did not put enough effort in. It falls squarely on your shoulders. Just try, 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 try again and try again. But here's what Paul has been telling the church in Galatia if you've been through our series Free for All. You've been set free so that you can live free. You've been set free so you can live free. Not meaning that you can go do whatever you want. But see, you're set free so that you can live free for the life that God has in store for you. And that life is not about doing whatever we want to, but that life is about becoming what we are, adopted into the family of God. See, you are set free to live differently. And here's this morning's message in just a little quick, quick statement. It has more to do with you relying than it does with you trying. Here's the first slide. Simply put, stop trying and start relying. As followers of Christ, it's time to stop trying on our own and start relying. Because it's not about you. It's not about your own willpower. It's not about your determination, your ability to earn salvation. It's not about your ability to do anything. What it is, is your willingness to abide and fall into obedience with God through every circumstance of your life. You see, the law and religion, it puts emphasis on human effort and determination. It has this, if it's to be, it's up to me mentality. But the gospel, the good news of the gospel is never about trying harder. But relying on the Holy Spirit to work in your life. Listen, church, if you are tired, if you are worn out, if you're frustrated, take a step back. And instead of trying, just evaluate. Am I trying or am I relying? This morning we're going to be in Galatians chapter 5, and Paul's going to go through a couple different ways that we swing on this pendulum. Imagine this massive pen pendulum, and it starts on one side, and Paul says to avoid that. And what we tend to do is the pendulum swings to the other extreme. And I think Paul has two warnings for us. He says, find the sweet spot. Don't go to this extreme, and don't go to this extreme. Stop trying. Start relying. I'll spend most of my time in one area because that's what the text is devoted to, but, but please hear both. They're both important areas. Don't miss what God wants to say through the book of Galatians. Saying over and over and over again as we're reading this text, just hear this. Stop trying. Start relying. Paul starts off the chapter like this. So Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free. Don't get tied up again in the slavery to the law. See, Paul is fired up at this point. He's already spent half the book of Galatians hitting the same theme over and over and over and over again. And he's no longer talking in the nice, monotone, Christian voice. Because he's pumped, and he's fired up, and he, he, here's what he goes on to say. Don't read this like a monk, but read this like a warrior getting ready for battle. He says this, listen, I, Paul, tell you this. If you're counting on circumcision to make you right with God, Christ will be of no benefit to you. I'll say it again. If you're trying to find favor with God by being circumcised, you must obey every regulation in the entire law of Moses. See, when referring to the law, you hear a lot about this idea of circumcision. And you're probably thinking, why so much focus on that? You know, this is 2020, we all kind of know what that is, it's not that big of a deal. But to the Jewish audience, and to people that are around the Jewish culture, it was a big deal. To us, it's a little odd, it's a little awkward, like it's one of those things we know, we don't really talk about very much. In fact, I had a student years ago at, at a different church, and we were going over a passage in Acts that had talked about circumcision a lot. And he goes, yeah, question, uh, what's circumcision? And I was like, okay, we're doing it, we're getting into it. And so as I start to explain the medical practice of circumcision and how it fit into the Jewish context, he goes, "Woo! so glad nobody does that anymore. I'm super pumped that nobody does that anymore. 
And I'm sitting there, and I'm like, let's keep on rolling. Let's keep on going. But see, circumcision was the entrance into God's covenant to the Jewish people. It was the beginning and the basis for following God in all of Jewish culture. If you check out the Old Testament, here's what you'll see. That God commands Abraham, before you enter into a covenant with me, with your covenant people, you must circumcise all your males. See, it was an outward expression of obedience into the covenant that people entered into with God. Now in the Western world, it's pretty common practice. Sorry to tell this guy, it's fairly common practice. But 4,000 years ago, it was pretty unique. A way of identifying who was on your side and who was on their side. You know, it was kind of weird to us, but that was the context for the New Testament. So when Paul is writing, and you see circumcision, this isn't a reference to a medical practice used, by ba- used on baby boys. But it was such a heavy imp- implication that you agreed to enter into a covenant with God. When people were wanting to follow Jesus, they were first told, well, you have to become Jewish first. And for you to become Jewish, you have to be circumcised. And then after you become circumcised, and then you become Jewish, then you follow the law, and then you do this, 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 this. Can you imagine the hurdles that went in people's minds when they realized, I'm a sinful person, and I believe in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I want to know, what do I have to do to follow him? Only to be met by a list of things you have to do before you can even follow Jesus. Paul is saying this, that is nonsense. Let people follow Christ right now. If you're, in the, if you're in the auditorium or if you're listening online, you're thinking, I really have to get all my ducks in a row before I can start following Jesus. Paul says this, nonsense. Start now and learn to see what that looks like. You see, today I don't see a lot of people taking pride in their circumcision, but I see a lot of people taking pride in things similar to that on the same level. And it's because here's what we believe, that if we keep following the rules, if we keep being good and start, stop avoiding the bad, then maybe God will love us more. Maybe if I sin less than this person, if I follow more rules than that person, maybe God will bless me more than they would bless that person. We think that following this rule, this law, actually makes us better people. But Paul goes on, here's what he goes on to say. For if you're trying to make yourself right with God by keeping the law, you've been cut off from Christ. You have fallen away from God's grace. But we who live by the Spirit, we eagerly wait to receive by faith the righteousness God has promised us. For when we place our faith in Christ Jesus, there is no benefit being circumcised or being uncircumcised. What is important is faith expressed in itself in love. Did you hear that? Let me read that first part to you again. If you are trying to make yourself right with God by keeping the law, you have been cut off from Christ. You have fallen away from God's grace. Paul's saying here, trying won't save you. Only relying can set you free. And if your focus is so much on keeping the law and not on God's grace, you won't just find yourself swimming against the tide. You'll find yourself in direct opposition of the gospel itself. If you believe that your salvation is dependent on you and your ability to follow some rules in any way, Paul says you're an enemy of the gospel. He goes on in chapter 5 and says some pretty harsh things for teachers that are teaching this as well. Say, I don't believe that most religious people have evil intent in their hearts. I don't think believers in Christ want to add burden to those that are coming into a relationship with Jesus. But somewhere along the line, here's what we are taught. To be a follower of Jesus, you have to act a certain way. You have to sound a certain way. You have to believe the way that I believe. You have to look the right way. And if you don't have everything all figured out, something's wrong with you, and you're not ready to follow Christ. Saying when you mess up, you don't measure up. Go back and try harder. Why do we feel so obsessed and committed to the law or the rules of following Christ? Is it because we believe that if we follow more rules than somebody else, it'll make me a better person? And we believe in some sort of twisted way that if we're better people, 
God will love us more, that God will bless us more, God will take care of us more. If I just learn to follow more rules, if I just do more good than I do bad, God will then love me. You see, here's what happens. When you focus on the law, here's what you're focusing on. You're focusing on rule keeping. You're focusing on rule keeping. When you focus on the law, whether it's the Old Testament law or whatever law has been written in your mind of what it means to follow Jesus, you're just rule keeping. But when you focus on faith, it equals loving actions. Somebody that has a real relationship with Jesus can't help but have loving actions overflow from the heart of who they are. So you don't have to try to be a good person. You don't have to try to do the right thing. Because when you love Jesus and you have faith in the gospel of grace and mercy, it's not about what you do. It's about who you are. That's the good news of the gospel. Paul says there is no benefit in being in the law. But wasn't, what is important is faith expressing itself in love. You see, religion without faith that leads to love becomes a standard of laws and rules that nobody can possibly uphold. And the end, if this is your relationship with Jesus, it is worthless and it is in vain and you're not going anywhere. It's just trying. And you can try as hard as you want for as long as you want and give as much willpower into it as you can, but you're not going anywhere. If I'm being honest, Jesus is not interested in a big crowd of religious people. See, he had one of those one time, and they crucified him. Jesus isn't interested in a big group of religious people that follow rules. He's interested in disciples that follow him and let love lead out of their faith. This illustration I have is the law, the whole Old Testament, the book of Galatians, when it mentions the law, what it is doing, it is showing you the standard that you can't possibly measure up to. And you might think, well, that's kind of cheating. Okay, think of it as you, however you want to. But here's what happens. If you read the law, if you read God's word, here's what you're going to find out. I don't measure up. I can't possibly follow all these things. So what happens is you then have blood on your hands. This isn't real blood for those who are worried. But you get blood on your hands. And you realize, uh-oh, I messed up, and I did something. And here's the reality. We all have blood on our hands. Any human being that's ever been born that is not Jesus, we all have blood on our hands. What matters next is what do you do with this? Let me tell you what some people try and do. They see they got blood on their hands, and they try desperately to wipe it off. And they get more... And they try, but then they realize there's still blood on my hands. So then they try even harder, and they try to wash it out. And they realize I still have blood on my hands. So you know what the church is guilty of? We see we got blood on our hands, so we take the blood on our hands and we, we hide them. I'm okay. Everything's good with me. You see, I don't have blood on my hands. Or... Maybe I have a little bit, but you should see this person. This person's got way more blood on their hands than I ever do. So quit looking over here and look over here. Look over here. I don't have blood on my hands. We try to wash them. We try to hide them. We try to point out other people's blood on their own. But the reality is this. There's still blood on your hands. And the book of Galatians makes that painfully obvious. And here's the good news. You can't do anything about it. And the reason why that's good news is because your salvation is not dependent on you. It is not dependent on anything that you do. It is not dependent on how many rules you follow, how much blood or how much blood you, you try and turn over. It's not about you. Here's what I'm convinced, that people in this room, they need to hear this for different reasons. Maybe you're a person and you're hiding your bloodstained hands. And what you're telling everybody, including God, is, nope, not me. It's not me. I mean, maybe them over there, but not me. I don't got blood on my hands. Here's what I think you need to hear. You are not saved based on your works. You are not saved on your ability to follow rules. You are hiding your blood-stayed hands, and here's what you think. This is a freeing experience. Reality is this. It is adding weight to a burden that you can't possibly carry 
when all you do is hide your hands. In fact, Christ took that burden from you already. And instead of giving it to him, you're too busy with your hands behind your back. And you're not living the freedom that God wants you to live. Maybe you're a person, and maybe you just need to be told this morning. Maybe that person's me. Maybe it's your family member. Maybe it's a close friend. But maybe you need to be told, hey, listen, you do have blood on your hands. And you might think that nobody knows. And you might even say this sentence to yourself, well, I'm not perfect. But at least I'm not like pointing to somebody else that looks differently than me, that sins differently than me, or believes something different than me. I'm not perfect, but at least I'm not like this person. Here's what I think you need to hear. You are just as guilty as everyone else. And a way to justify the blood on your hands is not to point to somebody else and say, but look how much blood they have on their hands. That doesn't take away what you have on yours. And the good news again is the book of Galatians says, you can't do anything about that. And wait for it, because it's good news. Because it's not about you trying. It's about you relying. Quit focusing on other people and focus on what God is doing for you. Maybe you're a person, you've recently found out, I do have blood on my hands. And you're scared, and you're worried, and you're filled with shame and guilt, and you feel paralyzed. And here's the question you're asking yourself. What do I do now? Who can possibly love me when they witness the blood that I have on my hands? Maybe you're a person that in the, in previously in your life, you've shared blood that you have on your hands when you violate the law. And another Christian, instead of trying to help you and pointing to Jesus, gave you shame and guilt, and now you are convinced, I can't let anybody else know about this. If this is you, here's what I want to tell you, that you've come to the right place. That you belong here at Boulevard because we are a caring community of Christians, committed to reaching the unchurched, not because we have it all figured out, but because we know the one that does have it all figured out. And we are trying every day and every week and every month and every year, not so we are better or so that we can wash more blood off our hands, because we can point other people to somebody that can do something about it. It's our mission here at the church. Paul goes on to say in verse 7, he says, you were running the race so well. Who held you back? from following the truth. It certainly is not God, for he is the one that called you to freedom. Church, this is not freedom. This is not freedom. This is freedom. When you take your bloodstained hands, and instead of you trying to do something about it, you give it to the only one that can possibly do anything else about it. That's the freedom that God has in store for you and for everyone else that's willing to accept that. See, you won't find freedom in a list of rules that you follow or don't follow based on the day, if it's a good day or a bad day. You won't find freedom in the law. You won't find freedom in a person. You won't find freedom no matter how hard you try or how long you hold out or how much willpower you possess. You only find freedom when you quit trying and start relying on the spirit in areas of your life you know how I know Paul is sick and tired of this concept? He's already in chapter 5, and if you guys have been part of our series for very long, you know the same theme is coming up over and over again. Here's how sick and tired of it Paul is. He says, I wish those troublemakers who want to mutilate you by circumcision would mutilate themselves. Do you know what Paul's saying here? Like, this is in the Bible. And I'm not talking about the intense Old Testament stuff. This is in the New Testament Bible. The ESV, which is a more literal translation, here's how it is written there. That I wish those who unsettled you would emasculate themselves. Okay, Paul, we get the picture. See, we're not called to follow the law, but we're also not called to follow ourselves. We have to get out of this mindset that if following the law isn't the way to go, but if we don't focus on Jesus, the pendulum keeps on swinging to the complete other side. And you'll find yourself not following the law, but you're also not following Jesus. You end up following yourself. You see, in the church, I've heard this called grace abuse. That you are free to do whatever you want. And some people even have this mindset. Maybe they've turned it off and they said, well, the pastor said it doesn't matter what I do or what rules I follow or what rules I don't follow. I can do whatever I want. It's all good. But let me, let me just give you this warning, that when you do that, you're maybe not following the law, which is good, but you're following yourself. 
which can lead to destruction. See, the pendulum swings, doesn't it? You ever found yourself on that pendulum where you finally find freedom for something, but you don't focus on what you need to be freed and, and become a slave to Christ. Instead, you become a slave to yourself. Anything we crave becomes our God whenever we experience freedom from the law, but we are not devoted slaves to Christ. We gladly, and even at times, painfully obedient to whatever craving comes into our heart, into our mind, into our hands, into our feet. Maybe you found out that the burden of your selfish desires is even heavier than the burden the law could ever bring you because you are such a slave to whatever you desire. And you want to be your own boss and your own man or your own woman, and I can do whatever I want to. I'm free from the law. I can do whatever I want to. Paul gives us a warning here. And if you don't think that the burden of self is a real burden, let me tell you just, to, just real quick. Somebody told me this years ago. If you don't think it's a burden, then stop. And I'm willing to bet that the burden is even heavier than you ever realized. We think these two burdens are on complete opposite, but in reality, they're all one thing. When we're not slaves to Christ, we're a slave to anything else. Here's what Paul goes on to say. For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but do not use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this command, love your neighbor as yourself. Do you know what Paul is saying here? Your freedom from the law, which might be the most freeing thing anybody hears this morning. Your freedom from the law. It's not even for you. Your freedom in general, whether it's free from the law or free from your sinful desires, your freedom is not even for you. It's for other people. See, when we aren't so preoccupied with keeping step and step with the law, instead we walk step and step with the Spirit. And the real benefit is not even for you to do whatever you want, to go wild, to do whatever. It's so we can focus, love, and serve other people. And that means your family. That means your work colleague. That means you can love and serve in your church family. That means you can love and serve your literal neighbors that might be right next door to you. It means you can love and serve strangers. You know, and Jesus had something to say about this. It means you can love and serve your enemies. Your freedom isn't for you. It's not for me. It's for other people to experience the love and the freedom that only Christ offers. Paul goes on, he says this, so I, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. No trying, just relying. Then you won't be able to do what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. The Spirit gives us desire that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. See, these two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you are not free to just carry out your good intentions. Intentions don't mean very much whenever we become a slave to ourself. You are set free to live differently. You are set free from the burden of the law to carry, you're not set free from the burden of the law to carry out whatever you want to do, whatever, whenever. What you should avoid. Sometimes we're good at choosing what we should avoid, and sometimes we choose the right, and we think that as long as we choose more right than we do wrong, then we're good. But this isn't unique to you. This struggle of the flesh, the sinful desire, believe it or not, I know exactly what Paul is talking about. Romans 7, Paul says this, The trouble is with me, for I am all too human, a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself, for I do what is right, for I know what to do is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. Have you ever been there? I know I have. Paul goes on and he lists different examples of what these rules, or sorry, these results of the flesh, what they really look like. And as he goes, he's listing these things. Look at how it all points back to me, or it all points back to you and your selfish desires. He says this, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, 
envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, anyone living this sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. The results of you trying, because I need to hold up the law, which you can't possibly do. But another result of you trying on the pendulum is saying, if I just avoid these selfish things, then I'll be good. Let me just tell you from personal experience that no matter how long you hold out, no matter how strong you are, no matter how many boundaries you set up for yourself, if you're trying on your own, failure is unavoidable. But Paul says there's a different way. And it doesn't have to do anything with you trying. It has everything to do with you relying, not on the law, not on yourself, but relying on the Spirit of God. Here's what he says. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. One thing I want you to notice about these fruit of the Spirit is that Paul doesn't say fruits of the Spirit. This isn't a buffet of blessing that the Spirit comes into our lives. He doesn't drop a little bit of patience, but oh, your self-control is really bad. This is a result of you relying and not trying. This is the fruit of the Spirit. They can't be separated. The Spirit isn't separated into different things. This is the result of you relying and when you are done trying. Sometimes I look at this list and I think, a little check mark, I'm good, I'm really good. Oh, man, I kill this category. Oh, and then I get to another one, I'm like, ooh, that's really bad. I really need to work on that. And I almost separate them all and say, I need to put them in this category. I need to get better at this. I need to get better at this. But if you hear my thinking, I'm still trying. I'm still trying to be more patient. I'm trying to be more kind. I'm trying to show more self-control. Maybe the way we should view this is no longer of a list that we have to do check marks by. But maybe this is an evaluation for you. Am I relying or am I still trying? Because the results are very clear. When you rely on the Spirit, this is the fruit that will come into your lives. I've actually seen it put like this. I saw a chart like this. Maybe this could be a way that you could think of it. You have three different columns and you have God, others, and yourself. And maybe part of this is, is that first column is the things that God gives you. That's the fruit of the Spirit that God gives you. That because of God's goodness, because I no longer have to worry about the blood on my hands, but I accept what Jesus has done for me and the Spirit comes into my life, here's what he gives me. He gives me love, gives me joy, and he gives me peace. And because of the love, joy, and peace, this is what I can show to other people. That I can show patience and kindness and goodness. And if I'm willing to show patience and kindness and goodness to other people, then this is what I'll experience for myself. Gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. See, these three different sections, what you receive from God, what you give to others, and experience your own life. I don't think this is the only way to look at the fruit of the Spirit, but maybe it might help you the way it helped me. See, once you receive from God the love, joy, and peace, you can then give to others. And once you have given to others, you will then to begin to see in yourself the very last category. But see, you're never going to experience the gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control if you're not showing patience, kindness, and goodness to other people. And you'll never show that patience, kindness, and goodness to other people if you don't believe and you don't accept that God has first given you love, joy, and peace. See, they're all together. They're not separated. And if they are separated, maybe you're trying instead of relying. You see, the key is not to be more loving or I need to be more kind, or I need to be more gentle on my own power, your own will. If we've discovered anything this morning, it's that you will fail probably miserably. The goal has always been to be more surrendered and more reliant to the Spirit than on your own self. Because if you are, this will be a natural product of your life. This is not a to-do list. This is a self-valuation list. Where are you? And if you're seeing some things on that list that maybe aren't coming to fruition in your life, take this into account. I need to stop trying. I need to start relying. Here's the truth, and I've experienced it myself, is trying leads to frustration. Trying leads to failure. 
I heard it this way a couple weeks ago, and it's kind of stuck with me, and I want to end with this. Living a life of trying looks a lot like this. Uh-oh, I messed up. Dad is going to kill me. That's what trying looks like. Relying looks more like this. Uh-oh, I messed up. I better call dad. He's the only one that can help me. See, living a life of religion says, God knows about this, but I better make it up to him by being extra good or giving more money or spending more time or just trying harder next time. That's what religion tells you to do. But a relationship says this, God, you know the blood on my hands and I can't wash it, I can't hide it, I can only give it to you. You're the only one that can do anything about it. We're going to end a service by singing this song. This song is called Always. And what it is, is it's basically uh, a proclamation of reliance that we have on God. And, he and here's what I want you to do. Whether you do it physically or you do it spiritually or you just take it with you, what I want you to do is notice I'm the one that got red on my hands on stage, but we all have it on our hands. And the good news of the gospel is it's not about you. It's not about you trying it's about you relying. So whenever you're singing and you notice the blood on your hands, don't worry about trying. Rely on God because he's already done the work for us.